G'day GDL people and welcome to another edition of Scripting Adventure. This is Bruce from Barking Dog BIM and today we're going to look at the tube command. T-U-B-E. Tube. Now tube is just a profile that's extruded along a given path. And I'll just show you some examples of parts that I've used tubes with so that you can see what it's capable of. Here's a roof access ladder that's based on a specific manufacturer's design specs and it's got various parameters that you can change including the height that's stretchable and it will automatically include additional items as required by the manufacturer's design requirements. Now most of these components are modelled with the prism statement except for these top grab rails here, which are modeled with the tube command. And that's a circular profile extruded along a path with curved corners. Next, we've got a roof guardrail assembly from the same company. The top and mid rails are tubes. The mid rail uses a rectangular profile and the top rail uses like a keyhole shape profile. And they're both extruded along paths with sharp corners. And these grab rails here are similar to the ladder grab rails with a circular path extruded along a path with curved corners. Here's a cut down IBC with the lateral hoops being tubes, circular tubes extruded along a path with curved corners. Here's a trampoline where the main perimeter rail is a tube extruded around a full circle. And the legs are also circular profiles extruded in this case along a sharp corner, but you also have the option of rounding the corners of those legs. Also changing the number of legs, like so. Here we have a bike rack where the main bike support rail and the tyre support rails are tubes extruded along a path. And this object has the capacity to be multiplied at a set spacing. You can also make adjustments as to whether it's double sided and whether it's wall mounted or post mounted. And when it's wall mounted, it will automatically stagger as required by the manufacturer supplier's requirements. Now here's a wall feature that will randomly generate panel locations, colors, and infills. I can regenerate where the triangles are, and I can regenerate where the infills are using a randomization code. This object uses the tube command for the triangle frame, but with an octagon shape, octagon profile, and extruded through a triangular path. Finally, we have some plumbing fixtures, a simple hose tap where I've used a tube for the bent spout, a tower rail in which the ring is a tube, and a commercial sink mixer tap, where I've used a tube for the inner hose, but also a tube for the spring, which starts off in a compressed state, goes to an expanded state, goes around the arch of the hose, and then finishes in a compressed state as well. So this is all one tube. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this under normal circumstances as it's pretty heavy on the poly count, but it shows what's possible. And I do have the option to turn off the detail. And have it showing just as very low poly count lines. And that uses the same path calculation. So instead of showing the full tube, it just shows the path. It's a lot more efficient for the model. You can also do more obscure profiles for less practical purposes, such as the stanchions here. So this is a tube with a quite a unique profile. 
extruded along a path with a couple of curves. And this appeared in a small production you may have seen. All right, first steps. I've applied my GDL work environment, which has turned on my Edit GDL Library Parts toolbar, which is this toolbar here. It's not necessary, but can be useful. I've ensured that under my options, work environment, model rebuild options, my interrupt with error messages is turned on. And I've opened my help under help, online resources, GDL reference guide. This is from 27 and on. 26, it's under documentation, GDL reference guide. That will open the online PDF version, which you can view online or download and open in a viewer of your choice. And the online version can be found at gdl.graphisoft.com and click on reference guide. Now tubes can be found under 3D shapes, shapes generated from polylines and tube. And here's the command. And you've got a bunch of letters and numbers and a whole bunch of confusing text down here. And of course it's once again, quite overwhelming as to what it all means, but let's step through it and make sense of it. So first up, we have the command tube. Well, that's pretty straightforward and put in that. Next, we have an N and an M. And as typical with the reference guide, all of these have a description below as to what they mean. So we can see that N is the number of polyline nodes. Mm, not sure what that means. And M is the number of path nodes. Right, well, path, we know what that means. That's the path that our profile is extruded along. That means that our N is the profile that we're defining. All right, well, that's understandable. The next parameter is the mask, and the mask is defined down here, mask, and it has various binary flags that will turn on and off various functions of the tube. Visibility, we'll explore that a little bit later. Now we get to the profile definition. You can see that they've used U and W as the axes. Now don't let that confuse you. These are just the equivalent of the X and Y axes, but they're just tipped to be perpendicular to the path. And the reason they've used U and W is because they can't use X and Y, otherwise you'd be confused as to which was which. So that's the reason for that. U and W is the same as X and Y, but for the profile. Next, we've got the status code for the profile. Now with the majority of our 3D commands, we use the status codes one through 15 to define the visibility of the edges and surfaces. We don't do that with the tube. It just has three status codes, zero, one, and two. Zero is visible. One is only used for showing the contour and two is only used when using the Z buffer rendering engine. And I don't even know if that's a thing anymore, but in any case, I've never used two. However, the additional status codes that you use to define curves are still valid for defining your profile, but not your path. So status codes, additional status codes, now these ones here. So these are all valid in defining your profile particularly these curved ones that you will need to use to define the outline of your profile. However, these cannot be used in defining your path. Each point along your path has to be plotted. So this is our profile definition here. And this N is this N here. Then we have our path definition. And this M is this M here. And the path is defined with an X, a Y, and a Z point for each point along your path, and also an angle of rotation at that point in the path. Now, a final word about the profile and path coordinates. The profile must actually define a shape. It can't be a point or a line. So usually a minimum of three profile points, which is a triangle, 
but you can use two if you're defining a circle. So the reference guide, reference guide here says n, which is our number of profile points, must be greater than two, but it can be two if you're defining a circle. And m, which is our number of path points, must be greater than three. And the reason for that is that your path has a lead in and a lead out as well, which doesn't get the profile extruded to it because what those lead in and lead out points are doing on the path is defining the start angle of your face and the finish angle of your face. And we'll go over that in a bit. Right, enough talk, let's fight. Let's start a new object by clicking this button here, new object, or I can go file, libraries and objects, new object. I'll restore down using this button up here. On a Mac, it's right click on the tab and choose undock. And I'll open a 3D dialog and a 3D view window. We'll leave the subtype as model element for now. And because this is just a demonstration, I'll leave all these blank. But if you're doing a proper part, make sure you fill those out. And in the 2D script, I'll just put in my project to command. So that means that when I place it in my floor plan, we'll have something to look at. And in my 3D script, I'll copy in some starter code, as is my want. We'll get started on our tube. So we'll just do a simple rectangle for our profile and a straight line for our path, just so that we can understand the fundamentals of how this works. All right, so the command is tube. N is the profile, so the profile is a rectangle, so N will be four points. M is our path, and we're just doing a straight path, so we'll have a lead in and a lead out, plus two points on along that path, so it'll be four points on our path. The mask, for now, I'll just leave as zero, and my rectangular profile will be zero, zero, one. I'll just create a couple of variables to use with my profile. So that's my profile, starts at zero, goes across to the width, then it goes across to the width and up to the height, then back to zero, but still at the high. So that's our profile. Now for our path. To make things a bit easier to read, we can put in an extra carriage return to separate out our profile from our path. Especially with more complex profiles and paths, that can make a lot of difference with understanding how the command goes together. Now with a tube path, you need those two extra path nodes beyond what you want to actually appear as actual geometry. If we want to model a straight tube like this, then we'll need to plot a path like this with the four points as shown. So points one to two are your lead in, which define the angle of your start face, and points three to four are your lead out, which define the angle of your finish face. So our first point in the X will be minus one and zero, zero, zero. So remembering that's X, Y, Z, and angle. That's our lead in, then we'll go to zero, 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 zero. That's our first point that we'll be drawing our profile. Then we'll go to the end. Now I'll just put in another variable here for our leg length and make it 500 mil. Remembering of course that length units in GDL are in meters, not in millimeters. So now in the X, we wanna go leg length and the rest will be zero. And that is our tube. These two lines here are our tube. Now we need the lead out. So we'll go positive one. Sorry, we'll go leg length plus one, zero, zero, zero. Check our script. Not enough parameters. I have forgotten a comma here. Good. Let's have a look at our 3D view. And there is our tube. Now it looks a bit funny at the moment. It's completely hollow. Just change to a perspective. And the edges aren't rendering quite right. Now the reason the edges aren't rendering right is because I've used one 
and that means that the edges are invisible except for showing the contour. So if I was to place this in the model and view it in a sectional elevation from the side, they'd show up. So what I want is my edges to be zero. So let's change these to zero. Right, all zeros. Now I've got sharp edges. But I have no ends. I have no lines on my ends either. So this is where our mask controls come in. So J1 is base surface is present, and J1 is one. So let's do that. One. Now I've got a surface, but no lines, and I don't have an end surface or lines. J2 is end surface is present, J2 is two. So let's put it in here, plus two. Now I have an end surface. I'll just quickly create a surface parameter, just so it's a bit easier to see. And under my 3D script. Right, so we've got a glass surface that we can see through. See what's going on. J5 is base edges at X2, Y2, Z2, so that's the edges at the first surface are visible. So J5 is 16, so I'll add 16 to that. There we go, there's my start edges. And J6 is end edges at XM minus one, so this is XM here, that's M minus one, so it's the end surface. The end edges are visible, and J6 is 32. So let's add 32 to that. There's my end edges. So if I was to get rid of those first two, I've now got a hollow tube again. I have my start and my end edges. I'll just put them back in. So that's a straight tube with a nice simple rectangular profile. Now I'll just demonstrate this last status, which is angle. So if I was to change this angle here, so this line here is my first surface at this end. This line here is my last surface here. So if I was to change that to say 30 degrees angle, let's see what happens. Right, we can see that it's twisted down through 30 degrees. Typically you don't do that because it doesn't end up looking very neat. But you know it's there. Let's change that back to zero. Got my straight tube back. Now what we'll do is we will add a line, a 3D line, indicating where the path is going. So you can see how the path relates to the tube. And in order to do that, I'll need to use my put and my use and my get statements, my buffer manipulation. And if you want to know more about buffer manipulation, have a check out of my video seven, which I'll link up there. This is my path down here. So what I'll do is I'll put it into my buffer using the put command. I'll put those up there. So what that's doing is it's putting all of my coordinates into the temporary memory. And then down here, what I'll do is I'll go get number of stored parameters, get NSP. Now, and also up here, I will change this to number of stored parameters divided by four. What does that do? I have all of this stored in my buffer and I need to define the number of coordinate lines. So I've got four coordinates per line or four parameters per line. So I divide my number of stored parameters, which is NSP by four, which will give me my M number of path lines. So there should be no change, no change. So it's working fine. Now I'll just add in some code to draw a 3D line along the path. In order to do that, I will need to reuse these 
parameters I've stored in my buffer. So I'll need to use my number of stored parameters instead of getting them, because getting them will clear them from the memory. Use them will use them, but leave them there. So I'll use them so I can reuse them down here. So change my pen to two. I'll set some temporary variables, x2, y2, z2, and trash. I'll explain trash in a minute. But x2, y2, and z2 are my line end coordinates, and I'll get the first parameter. I don't need the angle or my line, so I'll just get rid of that altogether into a, into a variable just to get rid of it. And then I'll enter into a loop. For i equals 1 to the number of lines, 1, 2, 3, 4, I'll swap x1 for x2, y1 for y2, z1 for z2. I'll get the, then I'll get the next parameters stored in my buffer. So I, now I have a line beginning and line end. And then I'll draw my line. And then I'll loop through and I need to swap the end of that line to the beginning of the next line and grab the next one. And so that's how it works through the loop using what's stored in the buffer. Right, let's have a look. There is my line. So I've got a lead in, drawing my path and my lead out. I'll just make these a bit shorter. Typically you extend them one because it's nice and easy, but it's making this a bit big. So what I'll do is I'll just change this out for leg instead of one. Right, it's a bit shorter now. Now, if I want my profile to be drawn in the middle, I need to change where I've drawn my profile. So I would, instead of 0, 0, 0, I would make that minus profile divided by 2. Let's do that so you can see what I mean. So what I've done is I've just started now at half the profile width and half the profile height and drawn it around the center. So this path should remain the same and this tube should drop down to the center. There it is. Okay, so I'll save my part, click on the save, I can go control S, save it to an external location for data safety and I'll call it 031 BDB tube. Let's place it in my plan. It's pre-selected, ready to go, because I've just created it. And here is my tube, viewed from above. So that's a straight tube, but that doesn't really demonstrate what the lead in and lead out does. So let's just show you a variation on that. So if we plot our four path points like this, one through four, so it's the same as the straight tube example, except points one and four are off axis. We've got our lead in and our lead out. And what that means is the start face and end face will be angled. So our tube will look like this. And that's because the start face and end faces, the angles of those are determined by the bisecting angle between the lead in and the path and the lead out in the path. So with our path, instead of starting in the negative x, I'll start at 0x at the negative y. 0x, negative y, and then draw my path the same as what it is. And then the lead out will be at this point in the x and in the positive y. So I'll get a zigzag shape. Let's have a look at that. Right, eh? So that is the result of the different lead in and lead out. So if I was to just do that to the lead in, like so, this angle will remain, but this one will continue like that. So that's how it works. It draws the face at the bisecting angle between the lead in and lead out. And if you've got more segments on here between those as well. So we'll save that. Have a look in plan. There's our result. Now, if I want to model a tube like this, then I will need to plot a path like this with points one through six with a lead in and a lead out. 
we then project points 4 and 5 perpendicular to the axes in order to calculate their lengths because their plotted points must be absolute coordinates in the x and y axes. If we define each segment length as 500 millimeters and the angle of change as 30 degrees, we can use right triangle formulas to calculate our x and y distances. Right triangles are made up of a 90 degree corner. And if we know the angle and the hypotenuse, which we do, then we can calculate our x and y lengths using trigonometry. Don't get too worried. There's only two basic formulas that you will need to use that will see you through most problems. So to find our x, we use the formula cosine angle multiplied by the hypotenuse. And to find the y, we use sine angle multiplied by the hypotenuse. We can then repeat these calculations for the next segment with the different angle. So to find our absolute x for point 4, we add our first segment plus our cosine calculation. To find the absolute x for point 5, we add our second cosine calculation. To find our absolute y for point 4, we use our first sine calculation and the y for point 5, we add to that our second sine calculation. Let's see this in practice. So let's put that path in for a bent tube. So I'll start my lead in starting at negative x. So a straight lead in. My first leg will go from zero in the x through to leg length. Then my next line, so point 4, will be leg long plus cosine of my angle. What's my angle? I'll put in an uh, angle here and I'll say 30. So it's a variable I've just created and we'll use that down here. Step A, so that's 30 cosine of 30 multiplied by my leg length, my hypotenuse. That will give me my fourth point in the X and in the Y, it will be sine of step A multiplied by leg length and zero in the Z zero angle rotation. So I'll put in 0.5, which will be at least 0.4 plus, it'll be step angle times two, won't it? So 60 degrees. That will give me my point X and my point Y will be that plus the angle times two. And then my Z will be zero, my angle will be zero rid of that and then my lead out will be all of that so it will be the fifth point plus another leg length and that's my lead out in the y so let's see what that looks like we'll just check to make sure it works yep let's see what happens when i click in here okay so when i look in plan this is my lead in, so this point here is point one, my minus leg L, zero, zero, zero. This point here is my point two, which is at my zero, zero, zero point. You can see the axis there tells us that. Point three is my leg length, zero, zero, zero. Point four is my calculated X and Y. Point five, my calculated X and Y. And then my path leads up here. So if I save that, there it is. Excellent. Okay, so now we can do a bent tube. You can probably see where I'm going to go with this. This is how you start to plot your circular shapes or your circular paths. Now, something to point out here is that you'll notice that each of these segments has a sharp line associated with it, has an edge. Now I can get rid of those automatically if my change in angle between segments 
is 15 degrees or less. So if I change this step angle to 15, this shape will change, of course, but then these lines will also disappear. So let's have a look. There we go. So my shape, my path has flattened out because I'm only changing it in 15 degrees instead of 30, but these lines have disappeared too. If I was to change this to 16 degrees, they'll come back. So remember that 15 degrees is the magic number by which it will automatically smooth out these corner edges. So 15 degrees or less is what you want to use when you start using circular or curved paths in order to smooth out those junctions. So this is where it starts to get a bit fun. So we're going to do an arched shape or a semicircular shape through a semicircular path rather. And we do that using a loop. We'll be looking to create a shape like this, an arched tube. To do this, we'll need to plot a path like this with regular points around the curve and a lead in and a lead out to define our start and end faces. When plotting a curved path, you do it around the center point and divide the curve into segments with a set step angle. We identify the right triangle of our first point. We know our A angle, which is our step angle. We know our hypotenuse, and this allows us to calculate the X and Y points using the cosine formula for X and the sine formula for Y. For the next point in the path, the hypotenuse is the same, and the angle changes to step angle by two. We then recalculate. Using this method, we can find all the points on our curve, which will enable us to model our arched tube. I'll just start fresh so it's a little bit clearer. So let's get rid of these. And we'll go, we want to put in our lead in first. And when you do a circular path, any sort of circular path, you need to calculate it from the center. So with this bench shape on screen at the moment, I just sort of calculated it as I went. But if you want to do a circular shape, you do it from the center. So let's go our first point, our lead in will be out at our radius point in the X. will be leg length. Our lead in will be minus leg length. It could be leg length. Let's just go minus one. Our Z will be zero. Our angle will be zero. Then we go for J. Now that J could be any variable name I come up with. I could call it for boo equals one. But J equals zero because we want to start at angle zero. And we want to go through to, what do we want to go through to? Let's create another variable. We'll go to call it sweep angle, sweep A and we'll say 180 degrees. So for J equals zero to sweep angle, so zero to 180, and then we want to step, in this case, every 15 degrees. So we put in the key name, keyword step, step angle. Then we go next J. So what this will do is this will loop through multiple times. It will start, the J value will start at zero and then run through to here and then go to the next J and the next J will increment by our step angle, which is 15. So the next value will be 15 and it'll run through again. Then it'll go to the next one, which will be 30. Run through, next one, 45 and so on until it reaches 180, which is our sweep angle. Yeah. And what do we want to do? We want to put in our coordinates. So our coordinates will be cosine. Our angle will be J. And we multiply that by our leg length. That will give us our X dimension, our X coordinate. Then for our Y, we want to do sine J. And we multiply that by our leg length. And that will give us our y coordinate. Z will be zero, angle will be zero. 
So that will loop through the 180 degrees, giving us each coordinate point around that semicircular path. And then we have our lead out, which will go straight down. And in the X, it's negative leg length. And in the Y, it's minus one. So we come in, we go all around the path, we come back out again. Zero in the Z, zero rotation angle. We will keep the same profile. Everything else remains the same. Check our script. Keywords can't be used as variables. I've put in a comma here where I shouldn't have one. So I'll get rid of that comma. Right, it's okay. Let's have a look. There we go. There's my semicircular shape. We'll save that because I want to point something out here. You'll notice here that my start and my end angles aren't quite right. They are raking like that. That's not what we want. We want them to be nice and perpendicular, aligned with this construction line. Now, I'll just move this profile back to what we had it, with the path running around the outside. Like so. What we've ended up with is our start and end faces not perpendicular to the path tangent. Even though it's not what we want, it is correct according to the tube rules. The bisecting angles to our lead in and lead out are as shown. In order to get the result we want, we need to plot the lead in and lead out as if they are part of the curve. This will change the angles of the start and end faces to what we want. And so the way you go about doing that, we'll get rid of our lead in here. We'll get rid of our lead out here. And what we'll do is instead of J starting at zero, we'll start it at minus step angle and we'll take it through to our sweep angle plus another step angle. So what that will do, that will have the path leading in in order to give us our bisector, our bisecting angle, how we want it. So if I click in here, you can see how the path is behaving and you can see how the beginning and end faces are behaving. So I'll save that, have a look here. There we go, that's what we want. Now, because I've used variables for these things, I can muck around with the shape. Instead of my step angle being 15, I can make it 10, make that a bit smoother. And you can also see if I make it 20, I end up with these lines, these edges at each of the segments. So I'll take that back to 15. And you can make this a parameter for the user to define, depending on how smooth they want that shape to be. Our sweep angle, we can muck around with that too. I can say it's 90 degrees and it goes to there. 270 and so on. And I can also change my profile. So that will now be a circle profile centered around the path. There we go. You can see how it's cleaning up. Now, if I take this to a full 360 degrees, we've got a line at the beginning and the end. And we don't want that. So what we do is we take that out of our mask. There it is. So even though we've got these end surfaces where we don't really need them, because you would consider that a solid, you do require them in order to make them solid. So if I was to go to my plan and got a section through here, if I'm cutting that section, when I cut it with it, when I cut my shape, the cut fill shows up. It's treated as a solid. If I change this to a zero, so there's no end surfaces, what happens is it turns into a hollow shape. Now that may be fine for what you're doing, but you'd need to be aware of that. The other thing to be aware of is see all of these faces here. It's got an excess amount of polygons. So you do need to control that as well.
So I'll just create a parameter here, GS Resolve. That's the Graphisoft name for it. It is a made up, it's not a special parameter name, but that is the parameter name that Graphisoft parts use. Resolution. And we'll just put in a Resolve command here, which controls the number of segments in a circle and GS Resolve. So let's have a look at that result. And that has controlled the number of segments in our profile, but it's also introduced lines everywhere, which is not what we want. So to get rid of those lines, we change this status from a zero to a one. Now, reminding you what that is, the status of the lateral edges, zero, they're all visible. One means they are only used for showing the contour. So that makes them disappear. But what that means is that they will show up in my section. So if I save that, I've controlled the number of segments in my profile to keep my poly count down. And I've also hidden the extruded lines, except where it's a contour. So if I have a look at that in 3D, there it is. And to get rid of that, funny shading we'll just put our ends back on yeah that looks better and of course you can change your profile as well Right. So I've just returned this to a straight tube, as in our first example, because I want to show you a limitation with the tube command. So I have the lead in here, the lead out here, the two points for the extrusion here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another segment that not only turns it in the Y axis, but also in the Z axis. So it takes it out of plane, makes it non coplanar. And I'll have my lead out like that. So let's see what that does. So it's not a very pretty result. You get some ugly geometry resulting from that sort of path distortion, if you like. You can slightly mitigate it by using the rotate. Rotating it around. Rotating the angle of the profile around. But if I was to now try and straighten that up along the new path. It doesn't end up too well. So just something to keep in mind when you're scripting paths, that if you do need to crank it like that, sometimes it's better to do it as two separate tubes and deal with it that way. So this is that commercial mixer tap I showed you at the beginning with the helix. Now you can do helixes because the step up is slight. It can handle those. But you can see that as it starts to turn, over the arch here, we start to get more and more distortion in the tube. It starts to add in unwanted lines to the point where it actually starts to twist the tube. Now, I've asked Graphisoft about this, and this is a limitation in the tube command. You just need to be aware of that limitation. They have introduced a macro in their library called Gravity Tube. And there's no documentation on this. It's not a GDL command. It is a macro that sits in the library. And if you want to read up about it, it's pretty complex. But this is the forum topic here. And I'll, I'll post that in the comments below. Well, that wraps this one up. If you liked the video, give it a like. If you want to learn GDL and you think this channel has value for you, then subscribe as well. Go and script something. I'll see you in the next one.